everybody, Kale here with Zero Tolerance, and welcome to another edition of our Meet the Brewers series. Today, we have a special guest. We have Jesse Bufton joining us from Groundbreaker. Thank you so much for joining us, Jesse. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Kale. I'm excited. Excellent. And you, uh, Groundbreaker, uh, is basically the original United States gluten-free brewery. So tell us about uh, when did Groundbreaker open? How long has it been been open for? And just a little bit of the backstory about Groundbreaker. Yeah, so we were the first 100% uh, dedicated gluten-free brewery in the country. So there were breweries before us that made gluten-free beer, but all the beer we've ever made is 100% gluten-free beer. You know, our, our goal has never been to make, uh, you know, enzymatically, uh, you know, or, um, you know, chemically reduced or removed gluten-free beers. You know, there's no truck that leaves those breweries at the end of the day that says gluten on the side of it. So our philosophy is, you know, always been to you know, start with what you want and leave out what you don't. So we make 100% gluten-free beer 100% of the time. Um, and we started uh, in 2011 um, and sort of like the, you know, the birth story of Groundbreaker is our founder, James Neumeister. You know, he had some close friends and some family that were dealing with uh, issues around non-celiac gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. And, um, you know, it was kind of a, as it, is, as it is for most people, it's a struggle for a while until you kind of figure out what's going on. Um, and so, you know, they had finally gotten some answers and, you know, they didn't really know all of what it meant at first, but they very quickly figured out what it meant for them. You know, a big thing was they couldn't drink uh, beer anymore. And, uh, you know, James was a home brewer, um, like many people are these days, it seems like. And, you know, this was in, you know, the mid 2000s, late 2000s. Um, and so, you know, he was hanging out with some of these folks and, you know, tried one of the gluten-free beers that was on the market. You know, it was probably a Red Bridge or something like that. Everyone, that's everyone's favorite uh, gluten-free, you know, beer to, yeah, kind of punch on a little bit. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep punching it, you know? Uh, so, you know, he, tr he tried it and he said, oh gosh, that's, that's revolting. You know, like I, I gotta be able to make something better than that. So that started him on a journey of, of what became Groundbreaker Brewing. And of course, when he first tried it, you know, he probably made something similar to Red Bridge. It wasn't super great what he first made, but, you know, it kind of got him thinking, you know, there's gotta be, um, something out there that I can get, you know, starch and, and then, you know, convert to sugar and that I can brew with. And so you know, he tried all kinds of stuff, uh, all kinds of legumes and things, but, and then what he kind of settled on that worked well for him and what eventually worked well for uh, groundbreaker was chestnuts, uh, which are 4% starch by weight. So it's a lot of potential fermentability there. And, uh, you know, we've added things over the years and I'm sure we can talk about that a little bit more later, but that's basically how groundbreaker started. So I'm, I'm sure like the black bean beer was not a big hit, <laughs> right. maybe, right? It was, it was not like, a big that hit, was a yes. Big that comes down, right? Was probably one of the first ones he checked <laughs> off of the uh, uh, big board. <laughs> yeah, st stuck mash every time, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. <laughs> uh, oh, you mentioned it, and I actually wrote it at the very top of my notes because. Um, it's very important. I think that I get kind of blinded to it being a part of a dedicated gluten-free brewing community. I make an assumption that everything yeah. is such a uh, such, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote an article that was on Brewlosophy, not to pump myself up, but um, all the a lot of the comments on that were, oh, just put Clarity Firm in there. You know, yeah. it'll be you just use regular grains, Clarity Firm, boom, done, gluten gluten-free. No, we don't do that. So yes. it's, I want to be very specific that your uh, what Jesse had said is a very important thing that we we want to mention. It's dedicated gluten free using ingredients that start as gluten free. So talk a little bit about like I know on your guys' website you make it a point to say hey this is gluten free not gluten reduced. What's the difference between the two so people understand that? Yeah. So first I want to say, I read that uh, on Brulaspi and that was awesome. And then for some reason, I decided to punish myself and read the comments. Um, <laughs> and, and they were what you would normally expect. Um, but, you, you know, the, there's been, uh, you know, a kind of a solution for, uh, 
beer for people for folks that are gluten free for a long time and that was always you know clarity firm and you know it's it's very important for people to know that it it doesn't and you know lots of people will talk about this on the facebook group and they do a wonderful job uh bob does a really good bob kiefer does a really good um you know lays it out really well for people but essentially you're 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 just making uh the beer pass a test you know that it's 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 breaking the test when you use these enzymes uh and clearing agents and you know we we've always felt very strongly that you know back then it was kind of a hunch that the, these beers would uh these clarity firm beers would do still do damage to people um now there's actually a lot of science that backs this up um we're we're very proud to be one of the uh uh, breweries that are 100% certified gluten-free by the gluten-free certification organization and they're actually their parent organization um, uh, has done has sponsored studies uh, on this and so now there's starting to be science that backs up that it, it does do damage to people especially intestinal tracts and and you know it, it can cause real long-term damage these types of beers um, yeah yeah yeah, so very important. We want to get that out of the way. And, and in the U.S. Um, and Australia, New Zealand, uh, the labeling laws are a little bit different, yeah, right, than they are. In, in Europe. So in Europe, you can label something that's what we would consider gluten-reduced as gluten-free. So it, exactly. when you're looking at stuff out there online or, or doing some research on it, it's, it starts to get very confusing unless you know the specific differences and the rules between each country, right? That's exactly right. Um, you know, we, you know, as, as a, a brewery that exports beer, you know, this, the, we have to be very privy to labeling, labeling laws and they are really different everywhere around the world. You know, in, in Europe, for example, a lot of beers that are made with barley, uh, you know, can undergo uh, fancy types of filtration and things like that to to get below what they consider a tolerable threshold of the amount of gluten in the beer and can label it gluten free. Um, so, you know, we've we've been aware of that since the beginning. Um, you know, we started as Harvester Brewing and changed our name to Groundbreaker, um, but we've always been aware of that as a company. Um, and, you know, it's just always been our philosophy that, you know, 100%, 100% of the time, and that's just easiest for us. You know, we don't allow any gluten uh, on the premise at all, so we don't have to worry as much about cross-contamination. Obviously, we still worry about it, and we do an audit every single year to look at where we can improve uh, our processes to minimize any kind of potential for cross-contamination but it just kind of simplifies things <laughs> and and it's really the safest thing for the customer so yeah excellent um so that's a, a little bit about groundbreaker itself and so tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about uh your role within the brewery um what is uh you know what is your role within groundbreaker and 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 uh what's your kind of day-to-day -day functions yeah so when i first started in 2015 Gosh, I can't believe it's been that long. But yes, I started a Groundbreaker in 2015. Um, you know, they were uh, kind of looking for someone that could, uh, you know, help with bottling days, work on the dock, uh, do some IT stuff for the pub and the brewery. So they were kind of looking for a, a, you know, jack of all trades, which is very common in the brewing industry. You got to wear a lot of hats. Um, typically, there's, you know, not a ton of staff uh, in craft breweries. Um, so, you know, I said, that sounds interesting. It's better than what I'm doing right now. So, you know, I got the job and, you know, my, my, you know, responsibilities have kind of shifted um, over the years. I, I do all those things and more now. Um, a lot of my day-to-day -day stuff is, you know, responding to our distribution partners, working with them on orders, making sure we have ingredients coming in and beer going out, everything's on schedule, um, talking to customers about where they can get the beer, um, and, uh, you know, also doing the fun stuff, which is, uh, you know, recipe development. I work very closely with James Neumeister, who's the founder, who's still very much involved in the brewery, and uh, the head brewer, Tyler Kiever. And, you know, we kind of, it's a team effort. We work on recipe development together and kind of decide what's going to make a good beer. Um, and then a lot of my role in terms of recipe development is making sure we can make money with the beer as well. So, you know, cost analysis and what kind of price uh, we can sell for, what kind of price is fair to the consumer and what kind of price will make it so we can make money. Um, Cause we are a business, you gotta make money eventually. Uh, you know, that's, that's how it works. So, so that's, that's a lot of my job. And then of course, um, you know, that goes all the way from the creation of the beer to the end product. So working with our uh, graphic design company, P-Town Prints, shout out to P-Town Prints. 
um, uh, on the label design and they get it ready for uh, pre-press and then we send it off to the printers and I work with the printers for how many labels we want. So there's a lot that goes into it, but mm -hmm. it's basically following uh, everything from, you know, developing the beer, getting the ingredients in to making sure uh, it goes out. So it's mostly an operational role. Um, I will, uh, I will, you know, give a disclaimer that I'm not up on the brew deck and doing the brewing. That's Tyler. He does a really good job of it. Uh, I'll try to get him on here someday, but he's, he's a little bit uh, camera shy. So we'll, we'll work on that. You just, you just tell people what to do, right? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I just tell people what to do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm a car. I'm really, I'm a carpet walker. You know, I know I'm, I, I work in the walk-in cooler. I work on the dock. Like I said, you kind of got to do it all, um, yeah. but I do spend a lot of my time in front of the computer and just kind of, responding to things, making sure every all our ducks in a row. Um, there's a lot of, when you're brewing professionally, there's all kinds of regulations that you gotta be privy to. Um, you know, uh, taxes can be complicated uh, for, um, you know, excise taxes on beer. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff you gotta, you gotta have your hands in all these different couple of questions. Jars. A couple of questions as an add on to that is, um, what does it look like how do you decide, I'm sure there's a decision process when it comes to what is just a tap house, you know, limited <laughs> edition and what yeah. ends up going into cans and getting distributed. That's probably a big decision for you guys, right? It's a and really big decision. Yeah. So what, I mean, is it like, do you know right off the bat when you taste a beer, you're like, holy crap, this has got to go in cans. This is amazing. Or do you have to wait and tell, hey, oh, our customers just completely love this. They can't, we can't keep it. We can't brew it enough. Uh, what, what does it look like? And then how long does it take in addition to that from when you have that moment to, okay, how do we get this in cans? Um, how does it get, how long does it take to do the, the artwork for the labels? And then how long does it take to get out the door? What does that look like? So when we lived in simpler times, <laughs> the process was a little bit simpler, but um, we still use the tap room to get feedback, but the, the amount of feedback we get is considerably less um, because the, the kitchen is closed right now. Unfortunately, we have a very small kitchen. So for you know, safety and health of everyone, we, we can't run the kitchen through uh, the pandemic, which has been a bummer. Um, everyone misses the fried chicken. I'm sure you all miss the fried chicken. I do too. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a lot simpler when we could pile a batch of beer, make it what we call a taproom exclusive. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, Tyler and I could go out and sit in the bar and talk to people about what they were drinking and, you know, if they liked the beer and stuff like that. Um, so things were simpler then. Um, nowadays, we, it does take a little bit more foresight. Um, typically, what we'll do is we'll, we'll come up with an idea for a recipe. Um, we'll brew it. Um, and then we'll, you know, throw, you know, that usually involves a few different yeast options. Um, there's, there's a lot more options nowadays. We mostly stick to fermented yeast because we've had the most luck with it. But, you know, for, you know, for instance, I'm drinking our uh, pilot for our juicy pale ale right now. And I think we threw three separate uh, yeast at that and then we're, you know, made the decision on what, what the best one is. Um, so typically we'll brew a batch, throw some different yeasts at it, do some analysis of it. And then we'll talk about maybe if we want to make any tweaks, if we want to brew it a second time as a pilot batch, um, that's where we would get some feedback from customers. And typically at that point, we know if we're going to, you know, put a, put that beer into a can or not. Um, it's just a matter of kind of massaging it a little bit to, to, uh, bring it closer to what we feel like is the end product, if that makes sense. So it's usually a pretty quick decision um, when we taste a beer after, after brewing the pilot batch. But um, it does involve a lot, uh, you know, it used to involve a lot more talking to customers, but a little bit less so nowadays. <laughs> and um, once you get those in cans, I know I'm in Seattle, right? You guys are in Portland. Mm -hmm. And so there's um stores up here that carry uh groundbreaker and but it's usually like uh ipa number five dark ale mm -hmm. some of those ones that you've had for a really long time um yeah and do you recommend like if uh if there's distribution um in in someone's area do you recommend they they you know re, like actually ask the grocery store people or whatever to say hey can you get this you know this yeah. uh, lager or such and such because you guys have it in cans now they might not know about it right yeah that is a hundred percent the best thing to do it's you know we we do as much as we can we can't really tell a retailer what to sell it's you know it's, 
not really allowed, first of all, but also people have different, you know, tastes and stuff and what might sell at one market might not sell very well at a grocery store. So it's going to be a little bit different everywhere, but definitely the best thing to do is to, to say, you know, I want this beer from Groundbreaker. And, you know, if you ask enough, the beer buyer, buyer will uh, bring it in. Um, and just kind of to go back to what you were saying, it, it does usually take quite a bit of time from when we decide on a beer to when it's going to hit the market. Um, you know, once we pilot batch uh, something out, we got to order ingredients, ingredients for it. That can usually take two to four weeks, depending on uh, how much, how, how, what the volume of ingredients we need and where it's coming from. Uh, then, of course, it takes a couple weeks to actually get the finished product. We might have to wait on labels. Um, things are a lot more complicated with the uh, freight these days, just with the pandemic and everything. Um, but I'd say from the time that it actually gets into a can to when it hits a store shelf can be anywhere from, you know, a week to three or four weeks. Um, and that really just depends on the dis distributor. Um, you know, our, our local distributor, Miletus, they're picking up every couple of weeks. So they can usually get beer on the shelf pretty quickly. Um, some of our other distribution partners, you know, Massachusetts or um, Maine <laughs> might pick up once a quarter, you know, so they, okay. they might not, they might miss out entirely on a seasonal, um, which is a huge bummer because um, we're, we're always trying to make enough beer to satisfy what uh, we think the demand is. And it's, it can be a huge bummer when we, you know, can't, can't get our seasonal that people want into BC or into Alberta or into Massachusetts, but we do our best. And, and to your point, it definitely, that's the biggest thing folks can do is ask for the beer. Nice. Nice. We were talking about this in our little pre-meeting here, but, um, you know, I feel like in, in, in the United States that a lot of breweries have to brew a multitude of styles <laughs> like they have to brew everything and uh, like customers tend to expect you have you know a stout an ipa mm -hmm. maybe a couple ipas a pale ale lager mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, what's your take on like i know in other parts of the world you were saying that that's not really the way it works like in you know germany some some of them you know they'll just brew loggers or something like that right so mm -hmm. um how does that fit into like the gluten-free brewing space and how, what's the challenges what's your philosophy from a groundbreaker's perspective on that yeah and, and you know i i guess i should preface this by saying you know this isn't to say that there aren't craft breweries in other countries and that there isn't a movement to have more uh style diversification in other countries there definitely is but but um you know it's it's a lot less common to see breweries in other countries, uh, especially uh, continental countries, um, continental Europe meaning, um, to brew, you know, a bunch of different styles from one brewery. Um, it's becoming more common, but, but you know, I've had the pleasure of, of visiting some other countries outside of the United States, outside of North America, um, rather, and, um, you know, talking to some of the really excellent brewers uh, in those countries and at those breweries. And, and they kind of think we're a little nuts. Like they think we're a little wild for, you know, uh, and really just spread thin by trying to brew so many different styles. And that's not to say that there aren't really good examples of a lot of different styles of beer that are made by American breweries. But, you know, you, you go to uh, Belgium and you, you know, talk to a, you know, pretty well-known uh, brewery there and, and they're going to be like, you know, why we brew saison because that's what we're good at why would you try to do that you know so many different things and and you know i think that's just kind of become the nature of craft beer in america and i think some of that goes back to you know that when craft was popularized uh you know the craft booms began in the united states the craft beer booms um you know a lot of it was a reaction to the kind of one style of beer that was popular in the United States at a time, at the time. And so we, you know, people were really hungry for looking for other styles that were out there. Um, and that's just kind of snowballed over the years. And it's become a, a very big expectation of breweries. You very rarely see breweries here that are doing just kind of one thing. You know, they might specialize in one thing, but they're releasing every kind of style under the sun. And, I mean, it's cool. It's great. You know, it's like we're kind of blessed in that way, but the rest of the world thinks we're a little bit strange for it. And and yeah, to to kind of answer your question a little bit better, Groundbreaker. You know, we we have to do that as well. We, we you know we're an American 
you know, gluten-free craft brewery and we're mostly serving American customers and they want all kinds of stuff. You know, that being said, you know, the largest portion of our sales is IPA5 because IPAs are, you know, the most popular style of beer by far in the United States. Um, but we try to brew everything, you know, our, our dark, dark ale is, I think, a pretty good example of like an English dark mild, which, you know, you wouldn't really think that's a very popular style, but the beer sells pretty well. We don't, you know, tout that, you know, really <laughs> intensely, but mm -hmm. it's a good, yeah. it's a good example of the style, you know, Olali's a pretty good uh, fruit beer, um, kind of unique as far as fruit beers go, I would say, uh, with the rose hips and stuff like that in it. Um, and, you know, uh, pale ale, you got to have a dry house pale ale, the American craft brewery. <laughs> so <laughs> I would say, yeah, um, I've had a lot of the dark, a lot of the dark ales, and it's probably my top two for sorghum based. Um, yeah, beers. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. yeah. I would, it, it, it is awesome. it, yeah. it is the most uh, metal winning beer that we have, much to the chagrin of the brewers at Groundbreaker. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Portland, talk a, let's talk about Portland for a second, because Portland is, or even extending it out to Portland, McMinnville, um, even the Northwest is interesting in that it's, I guess, kind of a hotbed for commercially uh, brewed gluten-free beers. Portland specifically, because now there's uh, Groundbreaker, who's the original, Moon Shrimp, who's a small, like, nano brewery almost, right? There's Jason's Mutantis, and then down mm -hmm. in McMinnville, there's Evasion and Beerly Brewing, right? So, I mean, you don't see that anywhere else in the world, right? So what's that like? for you guys you started out and now it's like it, do you feel like everyone's trying to encroach on your territory or do you feel like that's awesome it creates so much innovation and spurs like uh um uh new things to happen within the brewery what what is it like for the market that you're in for gluten-free beer we i mean we kind of love it <laughs> yeah. it's it's fun for us because well i mean some some places there's some states are still waiting for their first gluten free brewery you know it's it's pretty it's pretty cool that we have so many in oregon and washington you know like just in that kind of two state span it's it's pretty amazing and you know we we don't really view it so much as like cutthroat competition i mean obviously you know business is somewhat of a competition but um we know those guys pretty well you know like we jp comes by the brewery and we you know might buy some ingredients from him he might buy some stuff from us when you know we have weird uh supply stuff going on and and you know we sell a lot of those guys' beers out of our tap room too and i i'm really excited about uh jason's place opening up that's been really exciting for us and you know i mean yeah there's competition but i mean the reality is it's the coolest thing in the world for our customers and our consumers you know more choice is what the craft brewing industry is all about i mean it gets people excited you know nothing gets people excited like more choice and and you know yeah you know james you know and his wife have gone to all those places and you know enjoyed the beer and lots of the folks that work at groundbreaker have gone to those places and enjoyed the beer so um you know it's not you know it's not like we you know don't talk and it's some weird you know intense competition obviously it's competitive because business is competitive but we're pretty good friends with all those folks so nice we've nice. done we've we've done tap takeovers to have ghost fish and moon shrimp and evasion and beer leon and we loved I, I miss doing those events i mean that was i guess that's something i forgot to mention i usually organize the events at groundbreaker and it's been a year plus without events and gosh it's been it's been a bummer because I love doing the tap takeovers. We would do a fresh hop one, have everyone's fresh hop beers on, uh, you know, kind of a harvest autumn one where we get some of those amazing, you know, I think we did that carrot stein that Ben the Evasion did, and that was really something else. So I, I miss that stuff. But Oh, speaking of um, events, um, you Groundbreaker has been pretty active within um, the homebrew side as well. I know that... Uh, a couple of years ago, you guys had a homebrew competition, which was a, a big thing. And um, even it seems like a lot of the commercial side is is pretty uh, um, uh, has their finger on the pulse of the homebrew community as well. So um, 
are you do you do you take um, a lot of that information and uh, are, how do you feel about the the relationship between the homebrew community, gluten free, and the commercial side? I mean, I think it's a strong relationship. I, I I'm you know I'm been a member of Zero Tolerance since it founded, um, and you know since Joe founded it. All, the, all those years ago now, I guess, <laughs> a few years ago, I guess. But uh, yeah, we did the homebrew competition. Um, we'd hope to do it again in 2020. We kind of started out wanting to do it annually. And then after the first one, we decided it would maybe be better to do it every other year. Um, but um, 2020, it just kind of never was able to come together because of the pandemic, obviously. Um, but I think it's a great, great relationship that the craft side of the gluten-free uh, beer industry has um, with the homebrew side. And I mean, I know uh, I'm on the forum reading what people have to say and trying to answer stuff to the best of my ability when folks have questions. And I think, you know, I might have some insight or, uh, you know, Tyler might have some insight or head brewer and try and help folks out. And I think that a lot of uh, the folks in the industry go on there and, you know, read pretty intensely what folks are doing because, you know, there's... Yeah. There's, uh, you know, I think we kind of talked a little bit about this in the pre-interview, but it's it's really easy as a craft brewery to kind of figure out what you're doing and and try and just do the best you can at what how you figured out, you know, how to make stuff and your process and stuff like that. And it can be kind of tough sometimes to try new stuff and um, try new processes because um, you are, you know, trying to uh, make a profit and you know you gotta. Make sure you're not getting too far off course. Um, but uh, it's kind of nice to see all the wild stuff people do. I mean, people are malting their own yeah. sorghum and stuff and all kinds of wild stuff. And I, I love that. Um, I mean, I, one of my, the coolest things, I think, my experience with Zero Tolerance was trying uh, Ed Golden's Hefeweizen, I think is what okay. he called it. Um, and it was like a Hefeweizen kind of style beer made with lentils that he had, you know, done a, like a decoction mash, like just like really intense multi-hour, yeah. you know, yeah. process. And it was just awesome. It was such a good beer. Um, so I love it. I watch it pretty closely and I think it's a pretty, pretty good back and forth between the industry and the homebrew side. You had mentioned, and so it's probably a good point to bring this up that, you know, a brew house when it's built out is usually brew, uh, created to brew in a certain way right and mm -hmm. um and sometimes that's um you know inventiveness on the homebrew side is hard to replicate depending on how, how your, your your brew house is built so and i know you, you were talking about hey so what is you know from a groundbreaker perspective are you doing these step mashes are you doing single infusion um uh, for your equipment, is it easy for you to do things like that, or what are the, some of the, the limitations within your system? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I think I had kind of made the point that you know it's kind of more traditional that a brew house is made to brew beer a certain way, or even going further back, one kind of beer over and over and over, and that's just kind of the nature of the industrialization process. Um, it's more common now to have you know more complex brew houses that can do all kinds of different uh, processes and, you know, that will result in all, all kinds of different styles. But, you know, we, you know, kind of started with, you know, the process was pretty well, I mean, James took a lot of time to figure out what the process was. And so when he, you know, commissioned the brew house, it was, it was made, you know, it was created to, to make beer a certain way. So we don't, uh, <laughs> we don't really experiment at least on the production system with, you know, complicated mash schedules. I, I like to joke on the Facebook group all the time about this, people doing all these really complex and incredibly impressive mash schedules. Yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty simple. We do a single infusion mash. You know, we only use one enzyme, uh, Sabamol BAL100. Um, and, you know, it, it works for us. We get 90 plus percent efficiency, um, you know, and we're using, uh, you know, variety of the ingredients, uh, chestnuts like we've used uh, since the beginning, uh, lentils, uh, rice malt, millet, buckwheat, any given beer might have a combination of all of those uh, in it. And we, you know, have had really good success with our process. Um, that's not to say that other processes aren't better or, you know, anything like that. Um, we just don't have a super driving incentive to 
make a complicated, you know, more complicated match schedule right now. Um, I, I am pretty excited. I, and that's not to say also that I don't follow all of the, you know, exciting developments in enzyme research that everyone does um, in the zero tolerance Facebook group. I follow them very closely. I'm incredibly fascinated by them. And, you know, Jason does a lot of really, uh, Jason and Bob especially do a lot of really awesome um, kind of research and explanation of this. Um, and then I believe uh, Aaron otherwise has done some really, really awesome blog posts uh, that I have read probably like five or six times. <laughs> I tried to just like digest every little detail. Um, but yeah, our process is pretty simple. Um, I definitely pushing for some of the ceramics uh, flex trials to be done because um, that is uh, pretty exciting. I think the Andi would be just a little bit too complicated for how we do stuff at Groundbreaker. Um, I mean, a lot of it just goes back to the cost of things. It's, you know, our ingredients are almost already so much more expensive than, you know, traditional brewing ingredients. And they, a lot of the beers take longer to, to make too, more man hours going into them. Um, so, you know, we just kind of don't have a system or the kind of, you know, labor hours available to do, you know, three or four hour mash schedules, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, um, on our homebrew group, I mean, a lot of those new enzymes seems like they they increase efficiency, reduce your grain bill, right? But at the expense yeah. of time, uh, mm -hmm. time is money in a brewery. Um, so it is. Yeah. It's like where is the line where that makes sense, or just you know using what you've already figured out makes sense, right? That's that's exactly right. Yeah, and and I and I'm always I'm gonna keep looking at it, you know, and I think yeah, you know, someday. It, the other thing is it's kind of it's kind of the you know these, everyone is out on this like super cutting edge right now of this stuff you know there's like a lot of these enzymes were made for the distillation industry or um you know breweries that are making beers with like really high levels of their grist from unmalted barley um so you know the enzymes are designed to be thrown at those types of things so um it's going to take a while to figure out what's best for you know uh gluten-free brewing but um man people on the homebrew club they're doing a really good job of of figuring that out and fast it seems like so kudos to all of you guys yeah and, and maybe one day there'll be a uh, enzyme cocktail uh, that's yeah that's specifically made for i know this is a big push by some of the members of the club right to get an enzyme cocktail that's specifically designed for gluten-free grains right so that would mm -hmm. be something that hopefully in the future we, we would have something like that right we'd buy it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. for sure um, uh, a lot of it too <laughs> <laughs> yeah i get like the little four ounce container right and that lasts me for mm -hmm. you know like four months right but you guys probably go through that in like one day right <laughs> we we go through you know we we buy it in the 25 kilogram per time kind of range <laughs> you know, that's that's what our typical order of enzymes looks like so um so a couple of things about the future um I see, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about like COVID effects, you, your, your kitchen is completely closed, which is a huge bummer, right? The fried chicken, all the good stuff, can't mm -hmm. get that. Um, uh, I, I saw on your website that you guys, looks like you'd like, will deliver beer to pretty much almost anywhere in the state of Oregon, which is crazy. Anywhere in the state of Oregon, we'll do it. Yeah, um, we, which is... we, we spent a lot of time doing really complicated math to develop order minimums based upon mileage. Not, not that much time, but, <laughs> but, but that is kind of our thing. We're, I think we've delivered beer as far as, you know, Eugene and, you oh, know, wow. okay. out in Hood River and the Dalles and stuff like that. So if people ask for it we will bring it <laughs> um that's great that's awesome and um and groundbreaker has a fairly wide distribution i know it's up here in seattle and pretty much all over you know uh, what canada united states uh, yeah part. yeah let me see if i can uh name them all let's see oregon washington idaho california uh we are in uh utah now as well um relatively recent development uh, and then uh, we're in Massachusetts, Maine, Rhode Island, Vermont, uh, Alberta, BC, uh, Manitoba. 
Um, and we hope to have exciting news to reveal soon. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to drop it. We're trying it really hard to get into Michigan. <laughs> so okay. if you okay. if you live in Michigan, uh, hopefully soon we will officially announce uh, that we are distributing beer into Michigan. Oh, so. great! That's great. Great news. Um, and then ad in addition to that, um, uh, for the the future plans of the brewery distribution expansion. Uh, tell us a little bit about like the vision for the future. Um, what do you see like a couple of years down the road um, where you're at from a distribution perspective, like the size of the brewery? Do you have enough space to continue in the space you are? I know that a lot of gluten-free brewers are kind of growing uh, very quickly. What does that look like for you guys? Yeah, um, you know, uh, those guys would probably be really upset with me if I said this to them, but I think we can fit one more fermenter in there. I, I, I say this every single time. I think we've bought maybe two bright tanks and a uh, couple of fermenters since I started there. And every time, you know, it's, we can't fit anything else. It's very narrow in there on canning days. I tell you, it's, you're, you know, trying not That's... to get hit by, yeah, you're doing, I, if anyone has been in, in the brewery while we're canning, you, you'd see how how intensely small the spaces are. But, um, you know, we, we try to, you know, to answer the question a little bit more seriously, we try to grow or organically, you know, we're not trying to have huge explosions in growth. Um, it's just, A, we don't really think it's a super healthy way to grow as a company. It, it, it carries more risk to do that. Um, works out for a lot of companies and that's great, um, but we, we kind of prefer to grow organically. So our, our uh, kind of more long-term strategy is, you know, we, get to how much beer is the maximum we can produce and sell. And then we look at, you know, what, what we can do in the brewery to increase production. And then we do that and we see how the next year goes. And if we feel like there's still more room, then we, you know, grow some more. So, and, you know, that involves um, sometimes really small changes and sometimes really big changes like a new fermenter or a new state <laughs> that we're distributed in. So I know from uh, my previous interviews and my you know experience that because I've been to ghost fish a number of times in that place is like same thing. Yeah, it's like it's a pretty big space, but it's like filled, it's filled up crazy full. I know uh, JP's brewery like is I know he's moving to another space because he, he is. Space, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I think that's a kind of a typical conversation. You're like I'm running out of space. Like we can't. Yeah. We can't fit anything else in the space. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've asked I've asked, you know, uh James, the founder, a number of times, like, you know, what what would you have done differently? Like what, you know, and like it's always almost always like I would have started bigger, you know, like yeah. I, I would have yeah. gotten a fifteen barrel brew house instead of a seven barrel brew house or, you know, a bigger walk in cooler or whatever, you know. Um, and it's the kind of never ending challenge is you know, when you're first starting out, you can only afford so much and, and, you know, you know, if you're going to be successful, you're going to need to grow. Um, so it's a, it's a never ending challenge, but it's a good challenge to have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I mean, you've been uh, a groundbreaker since 2015. So I'm, I imagine you were like the, most tenured guru uh groundbreaker one of the most tenured uh groundbreaker employees and you've probably seen a lot just in especially since i mean so if we're talking about groundbreaker being the first u.s dedicated gluten-free brewery that is like what less than 10 years ago and mm -hmm. look at all these changes that have happened like and i'm sure yeah. since you've been in there in 2015 it's been a lot of changes within the industry and a lot of growth and a lot of a lot of different things happening right yeah, a lot of changes at the company, a lot of changes in the industry. Um, I, I am not actually the most tenured groundbreaker employee. That would be the head oh. brewer, Tyler Keeper. But I am I'm right there close behind him. Um, yeah, but he, uh, We're going to have to get I, him on the show one of these days. He's like the Wizard I, of Oz, right? He's pulling he all the levers behind the scene, right? He's pulling a lot of levers, <laughs> man. And he doesn't like to talk about it very much. <laughs> but I, I'll do my best to convince him because he he will be able to answer a lot of these technical nice, questions nice. in deep complexity. Um, but yeah, I've seen a lot of changes both in the industry and um, 
as well uh, at Groundbreaker. Um, and I think I mentioned this before, but when I started, you know, we had uh, pretty much exclusively made beer with chestnuts and lentils. Um, and then, uh, you know, a couple years ago, um, I led a pretty big push, pretty big, um, you know, round of trials to get us to, uh, you know, start adding more ingredients um, into the beers. And, you know, a lot of that was, you know, our, our sales guy Paxton is always out you know, has always been out there on the road and trying everyone's different stuff and telling us, you know, here's what they're doing, here's what they're using. Um, you know, so him and James had the great fortune of making it down to uh, Jim Eckert's place a few years back and, you know, had his beers and we had kind of sampled his rice malts before, but, you know, like I said, it's kind of hard to, to get, um, businesses to do something different when what they're doing is working. So I kind of took them going down there and trying his beers and really, kind of being wowed by them, you know, and being like, oh man, like the, he, this guy's making some really good beer with these, in, you know, these malts that he's, that he's making. So um, we kind of spent some good amount of time, um, you know, re going through development, you know, redeveloping a lot of our recipes around um, Jim's rice malts. And, uh, you know, our, our beer has changed. The, the grain bill has gotten more complex, uh, less chestnuts, less lentils more rice malts and then the same thing with grouse um you know they make a lot of super exciting malts um you know c240 is a very impressive <laughs> dark malt and uh really opens up a lot of uh style possibilities having all these out there and it just hasn't always been the case that they've been out there and, you know when we started a lot of this stuff just simply didn't exist so we we did what you know what we kind of figured out would work at the time and, uh, you know, trying to um, make the beer better means um, being willing to change. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of a funny, like, myth in the craft beer industry at large that, you know, you, you get a, you get a beer that's a hit um, and you, you, you know, you never change that recipe. That's the award-winning beer. You know, you can never change, don't you know, don't yeah, don't touch. touch, but the dirty little secret is you're changing it all the time all the time it's changing you know you might try different hops might try different slightly different grist you know and if you're not changing it you know you're gonna get stale you're gonna get kind of boring so even our flagship beers you know people may not have always perceived the changes when they taste and smell them and stuff like that but um they're changing and they got to so well, I, I think that um, my beer is almost empty. So that means this episode must come to a conclusion. So All right. uh, if you enjoyed what you're seeing here, YouTube people, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, I want to thank Jesse Bufton again. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us um, an overview of, of Groundbreaker and, 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 and everything. That's, that was fantastic. Thank you. Can I, hey, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, yeah go for it. Uh, f favorite, favorite uh, beer. Are you, are you on the ale side of things or are you on the lager side of things? Or the oh. eternal battle between ale and yeah. lager. I'm just curious. Yeah, you're- How you're, Kale Baldwin comes down. Yeah, you're pulling my heartstrings and I did not do a uh, rapid fire question session for, for you, but my, my answer to that question would definitely be uh, lagers by far, yes. Well, then we agree, sir. Yes. Cheers. Yes, cheers. <laughs> and- just remember, no barley, no wheat, no rye, no problem. No problem. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Gail.